All right, we are live. Joshua, good morning. How's it going? How are you, Joel? It's a double thumbs up kind of day. <laughs> Thank you for joining us from Omaha, Nebraska. I know that you're uh, hanging out in some familiar turf, but not your home turf. So it's really cool that you could join me. You could join us for everything that's going on. By the way, I'm looking over here. We've got KB from Southwest Florida who's watching. Christopher Zenner in New York. I see Kate. Good morning, everyone. We're super, super glad that you could join us live. For those of you who don't know me, I am Joel Zaslowski. I am the uh, tech person slash moderator slash facilitator uh, and also the founder of Simple Rev. More importantly, at least for the next 60 minutes, uh, we have Joshua Becker. And Joshua, I have plenty of things to say about you, but perhaps for those of you who are unfamiliar, which will be a small minority of the folks today, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I would love to. My name is Joshua Becker. I'm the writer at becomingminimalist.com. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Joel. I am live from my mother-in-law's house in Omaha, Nebraska on a super rainy morning but it is uh, good to be with you and your sunny, shiny face. We have a lot of rain going on here. It's kind of dark in the background, but that's okay. Neither of us will be washed away. Well, first of all, so now that we've introduced ourselves a little bit, this webinar, Connecting Community and Simplicity, three powerful keys to grow life-affirming relationships. Obviously, me and Joshua are going to be uh, people who are going to be speaking for the most part, but we need you, especially the folks who are watching this live. We're going to continuously be asking questions and getting your feedback and engaging and re-engaging. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to do this and one of the reasons why I asked Joshua to help with the first ever Simpleware webinar is I couldn't think of a single better person. Uh, one, as far as what we're trying to do with Simple Rev, that intersection of community and simplicity. And Joshua has been a, a friend, a huge supporter with the first of pretty much everything that we do. Our first podcast that we did with Simple Rev, Joshua was there for the interview. Our event last year, he opened up the show and it was wonderful. Uh, as far as how generous he is, uh, what he represents, that intentional living, the minimalist mindset, this is just a sweet spot. And we're really, really excited to give you a great next 56 minutes or so. Just to be clear, our goal for this webinar is to help you cultivate that mindset and give you the tools to simplify through your existing communities and the future ones. So over the next uh, 55 minutes or so, we're gonna explore why meaningful connected communities are so important. We're also gonna talk about how and where to find your, quote, right people, how to identify your community's needs and contribute to them, and then we will talk briefly about how Simple Rep helps connect those two integral things in our lives, community and simplicity. And of course, we're gonna field as many of your questions as we can. You can use the Q&A feature in the Google Plus event page. You can leave comments on the page itself. Uh, if you'd like, you can always send tweets to at simple underscore REV, or feel free to use the hashtag on whatever social media platform you dig at hashtag simple rev, simple REV. With that, Let's go into our very first topic. Why are meaningful connected communities so important? Joshua, we're gonna start with you. I know you've got a lot to say on this. So would you mind uh, breaking it down for us a little bit? From your personal perspective, what are a few reasons why community is so important to you? Yeah, and, uh, <clears throat> and, it, and the conversation starts here because I mean, let's, let's be honest and real community takes work and relationship is, is hard. Um, it, um, it, it takes an intentional effort on, on our part as we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, so I think that the, 
definitely, as we mentioned, this is the place to start. The first key to you know life affirming relationships is that we understand the need for them, uh, and we understand uh, what our desire is for them. I uh, I think that we are just designed for community. Uh, we're designed to enjoy life in community. If I were to think of a, a couple reasons, just uh, there's more than this, but just a few right off the top of the bat, uh, I think that community adds richness to our life's experiences. Um, that we that um, that we don't find elsewhere. Uh, when my when my son was born, our first child was born. Um, the first thing I did was call everybody that I know. <laughs> you know, I was joy's best experience when it's when it's shared with other people. And so, um, community relationships add a, a richness to our to our life's experience. Also, to the the pain that we're going through, the the hard times, the struggles, we uh, were able to find a, a meaning in them because of the relationships around us. Um, I think that relationships and communities offer us an opportunity to grow. Um, Anne Lamont says we're, we're given such small flashlights to navigate this world. Um, and as we surround ourselves with other people, with other experiences, with other talents and skills, with other flashlights, uh, we begin to see the world in a, a much better way that we couldn't possibly have seen it um, just on our own. Um, I, I think that we, uh, there always comes a time in life where we, where we have a need, uh, whether it be an emotional need, um, just a, a need for a friendship, a, a need for someone to talk to. Sometime it might be a, a financial need. Um, having built those relationships and those communities, that foundation um, that we can rely upon when the when the need arises. And I'm, I'm going to kick it back over to you, um, just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, I, I love some of your thoughts on habits and community and, and how they are closely related. But if I were to draw this conversation back to simplicity for the sake of simplicity's sake, I, I think in a world that is consumer driven and, and focused on consumption and materialism, that without a, a community around you, simplicity, minimalism um, becomes very difficult. But as we as we share our stories with others, um, we're reminded why we're pursuing simplicity. We find people around us who support us um, and uh, and bring accountability into our life. You know, it's tough to tell people that you're going to become minimalist and then go to the shopping mall with them the next week, right? So as we as we begin sharing our story in this community, it, it spurs us on to healthy habits, which I, I love some of your thoughts on that and would, would love to hear some. Yeah, well, as far as the interplay between habits and strong communities, uh, and I remember you talk about sharing the news with your friends at the birth of your first son, and I remember doing the same thing with Grant, and I couldn't imagine having that be an isolated event and not celebrating that, and also in the hard times too, I'm right there with you. And, and those habits, where do we go to when we have something positive, when we need help, when we wanna have a sense of joy, a sense of fulfillment, it's often through community. So these habits, uh, you were quoting Anne Lamont, I, I'm a big fan, and I think the, the flashlight thing sounds a little bit like your lighthouse theme from Bird by Bird. I don't know if that's the book that you were talking about. Charles, I, yeah. Charles Duhigg, though, so another book, the best-selling author of The Power of Habit, so he talks about this overwhelming evidence that changing our habits requires a new routine, and then your odds of success just skyrocket when you commit to changing as part of a group, and that's what I found, and I know that a lot of other people who are watching this have found, too, that belief in the value of simplifying for deeper gratitude or to get your contentment. Uh, they're essential and they really grow out of communal experiences. So even if that community is only you and one other person, maybe that's your spouse, maybe that's your kid, uh, maybe that's some person who you just met, um, that habit and changing your habits within a community setting are such a powerful thing. James Clear also has uh, this concept that I, I really like, identity-based habits. Josh, have you ever heard about these before? No, no. Oh, I know I mean, you. I love James. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, James is a fantastic dude. So he talks about how the results of your habits being secondary to creating an identity as someone who does or does not think or do certain things. Uh, so for example, if I want to feel less isolated, I can assume that persona of someone who cares and regularly connects with old friends and new friends, even though my actual habits my logistical, my time, my money, my, my priorities may not have actually changed by taking that identity of somebody who actually cares about people, who is generous in nature. 
I can start to change even if my habits haven't actually changed itself. That's one of the things that I love the most. Now, what Joshua, I think what we'd like to hear a little bit, I mean, we've already been talking for a little while. So from the folks who are listening to this, we have something that we would like to ask you. And it's a pretty simple question. And it's how have your habits improved by being in a specific community? And if you'd like to share that on our G Plus uh, event page, uh, that would be really cool. If you want to send a tweet to Simple Rev or hashtag Simple Rev, that would also be great as well. We're going to throw the prompt up for you just so that you can see it and get a little bit of information and then move on to another pretty nifty thing. So how have your habits improved? by being in a specific community. All right, so Joshua, let's go back to you. And maybe you can tell us about a specific moment in your minimalism journey where you or your family felt more connected to a community because you were focused on simplifying. Got something for us? Yeah, yeah real quick. I don't know what you're doing when the screenshot goes up, but I'm fixing my hair. Are you, are you doing the same when you're? Yeah, I'm looking at the brush and the one hair that's right about here, back here, and straighten it up real quick. Do I look good? Um, yeah, specific examples. That's a um, uh, that's a great question. I first off, um, like we're talking about the intersection of simplicity and and um, community, um, which is a, a great conversation and something that you've you've built um, simple rev upon. But um, you know, this relates to anything. I think anytime we open up ourselves to something new, we open up ourselves to a new community. I remember the first time I ever played the board game Settlers of Catan. And just loved it and then went online and found a whole community of people who were playing settlers of Catan. so whatever you know fishing bowling whatever it is when we open up ourselves to something new um, there's typically a community that we open up ourselves to um, as well um, simplicity specific um, you know one of the things that for us i it's just interesting that you asked that question because the first thing i think about is is my family um which you know some people might not necessarily consider community relationships you know, outside of our family, people tend to think of, which which is fine. But um, for me, when when we embrace simplicity, we we suddenly found the the time and the space um, to to begin spending more time as a family and and investing in them. And even I think the realization of how much I was neglecting that uh, because of uh, what I had been pursuing and and chasing with my life. So uh, simplicity opened that up. But interestingly, um, maybe even more than that, I I think our my greatest community started to happen when uh, I embraced not just simplicity but generosity along with it. Um, we uh, we got connected with a we embraced this. Uh, my daughter was two when we when we found minimalism, and so one of the things we were done having kids. One of the things that we um, were getting rid of was just all the baby stuff that we had collected and, and kind of held on to because my daughter had um, matured out of out of those phases and. Um, Turns out my neighbor, we were talking to our, my neighbor one time, and, and she was very involved in downtown Burlington with CareNet, which is a crisis pregnancy center in, in Burlington, Vermont, that they would just come alongside single mothers from any and every walk of life who, who just needed help financially getting getting started and, and, getting, and getting stable. And so, uh, so many of our donations went there, and as the it's kind of the the saying goes where your where your treasure is your your heart follows and as we began donating things to them um just found a found a heart for what they were doing and and the people that were working there and so we we made several trips down there and just became very involved in in the work that they were doing just very impressed and just very authentic hearts so um those are you know two examples that, that pop into my mind um right away that were spurred by this simplicity um, movement in my life yeah, and now that you've really gotten into it, you probably have more time to go fishing and maybe even play Settlers of Catan on the boat. <laughs> you ever try those two at the same time? I, I don't do much fishing, but uh, <laughs> you play Settlers whenever I can. Settlers of Catan is good. Well, one thing that I wanted to make sure that I highlight to kind of wrap this up before we transition into our next topic here, there's a great quote that uh, I've seen. It comes from Matt Hamm, and he talks about richness thrives in community. It's not something to be experienced alone. At our core, we are most satisfied when we are investing in someone else. 
that gets to the generosity that you were just talking about, Joshua, and that I know you and I try to practice not just on a daily basis, but sometimes on a minute by minute, hour by hour basis. And in terms of the people who we can practice with, how and where to find your right people. I know a lot of folks uh, have some struggles with this in terms of online, maybe they know where they can go. Offline, maybe they know where they can go. But joining those two things together, we'll kind of break this apart. We'll talk first online, uh, how and where to find the right people, and then we're going to talk a little bit about offline. In, in the real world, as people call it, where we can do that. So first of all, uh, let's start with online communities. Joshua, I'm curious from your perspective, and I know you've thought about this a little bit, what do you feel are the common attributes of valuable online communities? Yeah, <clears throat> which is the which is the second key. I mean, first key is seeing the need for community. The the second key is is going to find it, um, and and online speaking, which is where we are right now. Um, so I, I think there's a very um, you know important conversation that we're having. And as I as I look at the online communities that that are um, thriving, and by thriving I mean not have a lot of people, but I mean have people who are being helped and, and lives that are being changed. I think that there's four keys that, that we want to look for. Uh, number one, activity. Um, obviously, a, a group that's dead or a forum that's, that's dead where you're asking questions and, and no one's answering is, is a, not a group that, that you want to be a part of for, for too long. You just won't naturally want to be a part of it. So you're looking for an active group. And those change. You know, Groups are sometimes active and then they stop being. Um, so, um, so there's a space to, to move around a little bit. Um, moderation is key. Uh, I think a moderator who is um, asking questions, a moderator who is intentionally desiring community in the space where it's not just a spot where I'm um, where I'm writing to you and giving you my thoughts and not asking for any input um, or interaction with with what I'm writing. So um, a, a moderator who is um, seeking to develop community. Um, safety, uh, I think safety is key where where you can ask questions and get honest answers, uh, where you can be encouraged and uplifted and not shouted down um, from your point of view or, or for asking your question. Uh, now, safety doesn't mean that everyone supports what you say, um, but it does mean that it's a place where the conversation is cordial, which is difficult online, uh, especially in, in places where um, I think comments are anonymous is very difficult. Um, so I would look for a community where where the comments are not anonymous, but they're held accountable to a person or a face um, that, that we can be in that place where we can ask questions. Um, and then uh, and, and then a place that is specific to you, uh, I think is the the fourth key in finding an online community. Uh, one of the, the most active communities that I know of is the, of the baby center, baby center community. They have a, they have a forum and um, again, this is new moms and they're just asking questions. There's some, some um, moms who've been around for a while at, at, at answering some of those questions, engaging that conversation. Um, and one of the best things about online is that whatever your, whatever your deal is, you can find a community around it. Um, and, and, and many even in that broken out by, so here's a, Here's a group of simplicity-minded folks who've just had babies, and, and they're talking over what that looks like in their home and, and in their family. So um, those are the things that uh, I think are essential in an online community that's encouraging and helpful and inspiring. Yeah, and getting involved in those. I know a lot of people hesitate. I, I've been there. I think you've been there, too, in terms of the, the interaction that you have, whether it's on a forum, whether it's watching something like this, whether it's on Twitter. Uh, some people just don't really think that it's genuine, that it's real because it's happening online. It's, it seems like almost there's this kind of myth where you can't make genuine long lasting relationships online, at least without quickly engaging that person offline, in, engaging them, calling them up or getting on Skype or maybe even meeting them for coffee if you live in the same city or you're at an event. Did you used to feel that way and that you couldn't really connect with people in an authentic way or in a long-term way online. Yeah, and and just to be clear, I, you know, I think that the meeting offline can accelerate some of that. Um, but that being said, you know, and that's probably a generational thing. I'm 40. I don't know. I mean, you look like you're 29 or so, but I'm, oh, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 40. And, and so this, like the technical revolution took place during my lifetime. You know, I, I grew up without kindergarten had no computers and by the time I was in college I was submitting everything via computer so this this happened during my lifetime and 
I think millennials, you know, 20s, even early 30s, that this isn't a, a problem for them or this isn't a concern. The, of course, community takes place online, but but people who are older, I think, can be a little skeptical. I, I know I was um, uh, wondering if if really relationships can can happen online, and you know, for what it's worth, absolutely they can. I, yeah, I mean, it takes many of the same attributes that you find in relationships offline that we're going to talk about next, um, but. When you when you open yourself up to the idea that hey I can find a legitimate friend online and that there's other people online who aren't seedy and aren't you know just hiding behind their their true selves but there are people online who are authentic and real and looking for relationships when you come in with that mindset um, you're able to find them much sooner and much quicker and I some of my best friends I I was just thinking I was trying to make a list of um, like there's a list of people I've never met in person, um, only online. But I would go to their funeral. Like our, like our relationship is that close, just from interactions online. Um, it is uh, absolutely legitimate, and a, 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 it's a, it's an important tool I think for people to find relationships and for people to to be looking for them. Yeah. Well, we we first interacted online, and we're good friends now. But we didn't meet each other until maybe two, three years after we started engaging. And I felt like we had a friendship even before we met at the World Domination Summit almost two years ago. And I know one of our mutual friends, Courtney Carver, actually, I, I want to share something real quick. Because I, if I, you and I, we know Courtney in, in the real world offline. But if I had never met Courtney before, and heaven forbid, she decided or she, she, she there was a funeral. Um, I would absolutely be there as well to use your example. So this is a great post and just as a short little case study, Courtney wrote this post recently called Soulfully Yours. And one of the things that I want to highlight here is this, this service that you're talking about, Joshua, and I'm not sure how big it is for people on the screen in terms of they can see, but these two bullet points that are highlighted over here. What Courtney's really talking about is so not having pop-ups or, e or pop-up email opt-ins, the kinds of things that just fly in your face or prevent you from seeing something until you close the window. Uh, she says she chooses to generate interest and encouragement over additional revenue. Uh, and she tries to avoid anything that will distract and annoy people just because she is focused on that connection as opposed to, say, that conversion. And really what I get from Courtney and what's really inspired me in terms of how I do things is choosing those hubs uh, and those people, whether it's an individual, whether it's a community to engage with, who really focus on your active participation, meaning they're not after your wallet, they're not asking you to just passively consume what you're putting out there. That might be a part of it, but it's, it's a two-way street, even if it's not in real time. Uh, and I love the way that Courtney does that. And I love the way that she's built this awesome community around Be More With Less. One more thing that uh, I want to hit on real quick, Joshua, is this, um, this, this concept of being online and having it almost be transactional in nature, having it be very impersonal. So for the folks who are watching right now, we have a question for you. And the question is, how can we convert online transactions or marketplaces into more than just a financial exchange or impersonal communication. We'd love to see your comments on the G Plus event page if you're watching live, uh, or whether you're watching live or not, you can always send a tweet to at simple underscore REV or use the hashtag uh, in just a little bit. We'll be checking those out. And if you have some cool questions around that or some cool comments, we will be fielding those in the Q&A session. Now, oh, going, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> going uh, to offline, I know one of the things that uh, is a primary goal for a lot of people, you and me included, is we can, we can connect much deeper offline. If you and I were sitting at your mother-in-law's house, like on a couch together, and we were broadcasting, it would take on a different significance, a different kind of vibe. And having that offline connection is amazing, and it's essential, you know, as humans, this whole online thing is pretty darn new, and most of our best interaction still takes place offline. Uh, I, I know if you're in the US, you might never get the chance to connect with that amazing, amazing person, your friend in India, for 10 years, for 20 years, maybe never. Uh, it's almost the online equivalent of a pen pal who you have this deep relationship with. But for the folks who want to connect offline, Joshua, maybe I'll just start with you real quick. 
do you um, do you have a story about somebody that you met in person, uh, maybe even after connecting with them online, and how that just accelerated and how you took the relationship to a brand new level offline? <clears throat> well, yeah, um, you know, I can think of the uh, the first person that I met. Um, um, the first person it was it was just someone local. Um, as I mentioned, I was living in Bur Burlington and. Uh, had begun writing on this and um, stumbled across a, just the Twitter feed of a guy in Burlington. He was tweeting about environmental issues and um, just began following him on, on Twitter more than anything else and noticing what he was talking about and, and what he was interested in and, and um, just really finding some, some challenge in there. And um, so honestly, I, I, we didn't have much interaction um, other than I just began to respect the, the work that he was doing and... Um, I said, hey, I sent him a tweet. Hey, you want to get together for coffee sometime? And he was like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. And I'm like, was that, it's just that simple? <laughs> like, that's all, like, that's all I need to do? And um, so we got together for coffee and, you know, just found out far more in that conversation. There's able, able to have a little more give and take and, and discussion that, that takes place about finding, you know, his heart behind it and his passion behind it and, and um, um, seeing his authenticity behind it. And I, I would say that the, the most of my, um, online relationships that, that went offline. Um, many of them have been local. You know, that's probably the easiest. There's others that have spurred up at conferences and those types of things, but I don't think you have to go there to, to spur that on. But usually they all started with like just a very simple question. Hey, can we, can I give you a phone call at some point? Can we hop on Skype together? Can we have coffee together? Um, it, it all just spurred from one of the two people, you know, taking the step and saying, Hey, let's, let's meet offline. And, um, um, just very interesting how how that how most relationships can can start with just a very simple question. Most things start offline and stay offline, and then maybe I'm being Captain Obvious here. I just wanted to give uh, a couple of really practical ways for the folks who just they, they don't do a ton of stuff online or they just want to focus on their local community. A couple things I just want to mention real quick. So the first one is um, finding a group focused around an alternative economy whether that's an economy based on bartering or time sharing. One of my favorite ones actually is uh, time sharing, uh, time banks. So these time banks, that's where you contribute your hours in exchange for someone else's hours. Maybe it's an equal exchange regardless of the service and you get credits that you can use. So I'll just, just a quick example. So Joshua, you might spend five hours teaching me how to write an amazing book uh, or maybe hit a curveball, neither of which I know how to do very well. Uh, and then I might spend five hours teaching you how to use Excel spreadsheets or maybe how to start up your podcast. And that is a really cool way to, to meet people is whether it's through time banks or through alternate forms of, uh, of sharing, of exchanging uh, time banks in particular, but just in general, alternative economies are pretty nifty. Another way I just want to share one quick screen share here. For folks who haven't used uh, meetup.com, I'm active in a number of different meetup communities in my area. So for example, if you were to do meditation, and I only want to see groups that do meditation related activities within 25 miles, going to meetup.com slash find, just here in the Twin Cities in the Minneapolis, St. Paul area, there are so many different groups with different focuses, like within this huge thing of meditation, there's different, there's different kinds, um, different qualities to it. So really using something like meetup.com to just free groups and just pop on in. And really the, the key thing that I wanna mention, you know, separate from any technology that you use, the big thing here is actually go to a meetup. Actually find your people in person and then go there as opposed to waiting for people to come to you. I know that's really scary for a lot of folks, but it's kind of hard to skip that step. Uh, showing up is a prerequisite for a lot of amazing things that can happen as an individual, but also your ability to contribute to a community. Got anything else you want to say about that one? No, I, uh, I, um, I think you're you're right on. Um, and 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 looking for many of those same things that you would look for in an online community. You know, I mean, it's, it's not entirely that different. You're looking for activity and. A, moderation you know safety a, a, a place that's, that's specific to you and um you know i i, I found community at, at church you know but not every church offers 
safety and moderation, you know? So um, I found a, a deep relationship in my neighborhood, um, just um, kind of just kind of spurred on. We, there's four or five of us that all seem to be in very similar walks of life as far as our kids are the same age. Um, we're just very kind-hearted to one another. And, and so that, that spurred up there. So there's, there's so many different places that these can take place, but there are other neighborhoods where you know, the community is unhealthy. So it's, a, it's a part of, you know, looking for a, looking for a good one. Um, almost being able to be burnt a little bit uh, along the way, you know, taking a risk because the, the reward is well worth it in the end. That's a big one. Vulnerability. And sometimes being the first one to, to reveal your thoughts, to show your heart. I know that's difficult, but when I put myself in that format in a group in a community and I've allowed myself to be vulnerable, some really amazing things have happened. So for the folks who are checking us out right now, we've got a question for you. And we would like to know what offline communities you, what, which ones are you most active in? And hopefully, based on the theme of our webinar here, how do they help you slow it down and simplify? You can share that on the G Plus event page right now, or it would be really cool if you sent a tweet to at simple underscore rev, or maybe you can use that pound simple rev hashtag. Uh, wrapping up, there's actually, there's, there's one more thing that I want to share. Uh, Sash Milne, who is somebody that I've just recently come across, she is totally and completely at the intersection of community and simplicity. And I just wanted to share this quote real quick. Uh, when we have strong communities of people around us, we can borrow things we would have previously bought. We're able to exchange and with every exchange, we can connect through those connections. We build relationships. And with those relationships, communities are born. Think about that for a moment. Uh, and let's, what do you say, Joshua? You wanna cover some, uh, some of our third part here, how to identify your community's needs and contribute to them? Yeah, absolutely. Why not, right? We're here and we're talking about fun stuff. Again, just talking from my personal experience and my perspective, the, that authenticity, that vulnerability that we've been talking about, those intimate communities, the place where you can talk about the things that you can't talk about anywhere else, the things that people don't understand, really, for me, that's the role of community. You can do that as a family, but some people don't necessarily have family members where they can talk about these topics of how do you, how do you get more spiritual? How do you slow down life? Is it okay to have the kinds of thoughts or to take the types of actions and do the types of experiments that I'm doing? So Joshua, for you first, we already discussed the common attributes that we want our communities to have, but what do you feel the defining attributes are that we, as members of the community, that we should be projecting to make ourselves that valuable, that contribution-oriented type of member of a community? Yeah, and and how important is this? I mean, this is um, you know desiring communities, looking for it, and then and then being being the type of person that does well in a community. You know, um, we we desire community, but um, sometimes it's it's hard to adopt the characteristics of a contributing member to a community. Um, so this was a this was an interesting thought um, to kind of run down. What um what I thought were some key character traits that um that we need to exhibit or need to display, um and as James would would say you know even if we don't feel like we have them already you know we can uh, we can um, we can still emulate them we we can still portray them um in a in a in a community setting and so I wrote number one um, just a need for selflessness I think more than anything else um, as as we talk about hey how does a community um, benefit me. It, it's almost a, an interesting paradigm where, but a, a community most benefits me when I benefit the community. And so we come in with an attitude of, I need this, but I most find what I need when I'm giving myself to other people. Um, this idea of, of selflessness and we we ask questions, right? Like Like we're trying to get to know the other people as opposed to us trying to be known by mm -hmm. the other people. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that most people are, that many people are bad at names, um, not because we can't remember other people's names, it's just that we're so focused on them remembering ours that we're not even <laughs> taking the time to remember remember theirs. Um, I had a, a friend one time just at a, a dinner 
uh, dinner conversation uh, just said um, he said he learned the key to, to uh, good conversation he said I learned the key to good conversation it's asking questions he said, I just like just ask questions of people over and over again oh that's interesting how'd you get there what age were you um, and as you let people talk you know they uh, they become comfortable um, and they become comfortable with you um, uh, humility is is very important. It's a, a character trait that, that we need to bring into our communities. That, that we need to display um, humility in that we don't have all the answers in life. Um, that that we're willing to learn and that we need to learn from from other people, as we as we mentioned before. And I think that kind of gets into um, you know any any fool can start a quarrel, but the the wise know know when to stay out. Um, of, a, of an argument and so um, we come in with humility and even if someone's saying something that that we don't agree with it it's not always our first reaction to disagree with them and, and try to make our case but let's seek to understand um, more than more than being understood um, uh, certainly kindness um, uh, being kind to other people and patient with other people you know we're all flawed. Uh, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Let's stop expecting other people yeah. to be perfect, and and let's show patience and grace and forgiveness uh, and kindness when we when we need to. Um, certainly in family relationships, this is a big one. Um, uh, I, I was going to ask you, yeah, more about to to elaborate on some of these. That that last two, so selflessness, humility, kindness, and patience. Look, the, the last two, kindness and patience, are inextricably linked to me. I can't be kind with my kids if I don't have patience with them. It's just as simple as that. Um, I, and I think you've done a, a really good job of hitting some of them. Is it, was there any other attributes? I mean, we could list tens, probably even hundreds of things that we should try to be projecting in a community. Is there any other one major last one that you really want to hit on? I got 15 more, so just give me a second, will you? <laughs> check, check, yeah, just keep going. Me, Rapid fire, boom, boom, let boom. Me, yeah, yeah, let, me, let me mention just to uh, authenticity, uh, vulnerability, um, being being open and honest that, that, that we're not perfect, um, um, and, and being open to, to sharing that uh, when it's appropriate. And then the last one, which would be interesting to throw back to you, um, uh, generosity, I think, is, is so important as – you know where, as I mentioned, where our treasure is, is, is where our heart follows. And so, as we become generous to a community, uh, we get to it, and the community becomes more connected to us. And uh, generosity doesn't just have to mean, certainly in this case, money. You know, sometimes it's about time. Uh, sometimes it's showing up and helping to set up the chairs. Um, sometimes it's being generous with our relationships and our connections and, and finding more people to be involved in the community. Um, but, uh, but you, you know, you have, you have interesting thoughts um, and you do such a good job of not just being involved in a community, but, but stepping up and, and taking leadership in a community or being a contributing member of a community, I think is different than being a part of it. Um, so I, I think the generosity helps us move from being a participant to being a contributing member of it. Once you, um, once you agree and yeah, you let, add let's, to it, let's hit on that. But in terms of my thoughts about generosity, I'm curious about the folks who are watching and engaging with us live. So this is actually a question for them. What traits do you feel like you need to have to be a generous, intentional, or happiness spreading community member? And again, we'd love it on our G Plus event page. If you'd like to share and you're watching live, go there now. If you want to send a tweet to at Simple Rev uh, and, and let us know from your perspective, your experiences, the communities that you're part of, what traits do you feel like you need to really show and live in order to be that person? So this kind of gets into you know the next one here is the practical side of things. And we promised people some practical things in terms of how you step up in a community, how you be, how you be contribution oriented. And I just wanted to quickly run through uh, seven different methods that I've seen, that we've probably seen, and other people who are experiencing this, to, to be that contribution oriented, that generous person. So the first one is facilitating recurring live discussions. So you can do that in a forum, you can do that in Twitter chats that are happening for a specific group around a community source topic. And if you don't know what your community wants to talk about, ask them and then make something happen. Uh, the next one is organizing a casual, agenda-free virtual gathering with a platform. Like right now, you and I, we're talking on Google Plus Hangouts. This is free. 
And if you and I were just talking buddy to buddy right now, it would be casual. Maybe we invite some other people as opposed to just having it be the two of us. Maybe we invite four or five friends and we turn it into a group. Or maybe there's an existing community that we already have that we can invite on board for a conversation that's already happening. The third one is volunteering. Joshua, you're talking about this earlier, moderation <laughs> as one of your four key points. So being a moderator, being that source of sanity, the director of common sense, if you will, for some kind of interactive place, maybe it's Reddit, uh, maybe it's a Facebook group or a Facebook page. You can help somebody out with that. That's a super awesome way to do it. Uh, another one is documenting your output or the output of a community. One thing that I found is uh, having great experiences and growing through a community or helping them is wonderful, but how do we show, whether it's through a podcast, a blog post, writing in our journal, like how do we actually document what we're gaining or what the community is gaining as a result of existing. If you can do that for your community, if you can be that person, however that documentation looks for you, it is always an amazing thing to read somebody from within the community talking about the community and what people are getting out of it. Another one, uh, method number five, this is pretty simple. Notice when community members, they have birthdays, they have anniversaries, whether it's a wedding anniversary or otherwise, and just take the time to celebrate with, uh, with a pat on the back, uh, with a text, however you want to do that, their life events. And it's really cool too, when you bring attention to someone's life events, and no one's ever gotten mad at me for publicly celebrating their birthday or wishing them happy anniversary. So we can take that beyond just the one-on-one -on -one and bring in the larger community to the celebration. That's always a pretty nifty thing. Number six, tutorial for a community something that you're passionate about. So for our kinds of folks, maybe that's permaculture uh, or how to construct a tiny house foundation, neither of which I know much about these days. Permaculture, starting to get in a little bit, but whatever your thing is or whatever your things are can create some kind of resource for the community that will help them. And the last one that I want to hit on here is building a welcoming place for newcomers to engage and contribute right away. This is really one of the most difficult things is when someone new comes in, maybe they're shy, maybe it's awkward, maybe they don't know what to say, maybe they don't have the shared history, but if you can be that welcoming person or create that environment for the new folks to the community to engage and contribute right away, man, it is an amazing thing. So the last thing that uh, I want to ask here is a little prompt. Going back to Sash Milne, she said, uh, community is a place where the desire to share is greater than the desire to own. For those of you who are checking out the webinar, what do you think about that quote? You can, of course, as always now, uh, share on our G Plus event page, send a tweet, or otherwise uh, let people who you see engaging in this know how you're feeling about it. Joshua, back to you here. Uh, I, I know before we talk a little bit about Symbol Rev and what we do and how we can help, as you go through that list, is there anything else that jumped out to you or that you want to mention or comment on? Yeah, one thing that I might add, um, which is probably Im implicit in, in a, lot about, a lot of what you said, but um, I didn't hear it specifically, was uh, just ask the, ask the current leader, you know, especially if you're, if you're hopping into a community that is already um, displaying some of these characteristics of being active and intentional and safe um, and, and authentic that that, um, that just uh, asking the leader hey how, how do you think I can help out um, what do you think I can do what what does this group need um, you know usually if it's if it's going pretty well there's there's someone behind it that that is doing something pretty intentionally and um, so they might even have some some thoughts as well as to ways that you can get involved right on well since simple rev is hosting this webinar. And I'm representing Simple Rev at this point in time. Uh, Sarah Wakecamp and Andre Imsdahl also uh, heavily involved. They can't be here right now. I just want to talk briefly, and Joshua, it would be cool if you could share your experiences too, just for a couple minutes about how Simple Rev helps connect community and simplicity. That's the theme of our webinar. That's the theme of what we do with Simple Rev and the reason why it exists in the first place. Uh, well, the first thing that I want to talk about is Simple Rev Local Gatherings. And this is something that we're just starting to get off the ground. 
since our Simple Rev 2014 event in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Jeff Sandquist and Anthony Ongaro have been hosting monthly gatherings for people to lead workshops on how to reuse and repurpose things around your house so you don't have to run out to Target and buy them. Uh, we've had people sharing gratitude rituals and stories, their challenges, their struggles. It's been a really, really cool experience for me to see other people in the community stepping up and wanting to lead. Uh, Petta Wilson, who is just outside of Sydney, Australia, she has had and continues to plan more civil rev gatherings uh, in her area. And it's just really cool to see these people bringing their folks together around the principles of simple living. Uh, and for other people, it's still a little bit young, but we would love it if, uh, you, if this sounds interesting to you at your local level, whether you want to be a host or whether you just want to um, participate in something that's already going on, you can go to simplerev.com slash local. And we have some resources for you. And we also would love to have some folks step up as well. Joshua, I know you haven't been involved in anything related to what we've been doing locally with Simple Rev, but um, at your local level, is there any group that's simplicity oriented or minimalist focused that you participate in in your in the Greater Phoenix area? Oh, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, <clears throat> no, there, I, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't have any um, specifically that um, that I've been, I'm involved in. Um, I do get, you know, I. I um, I think just my my stage of life um, and and the place where I am, I, I I do have some pretty regular conversations with people that uh, that want to get together and and want to talk about um, simple living stuff. They they found out what I'm doing and they found out that I'm local, and so I get an email or or a phone call. Um, as far as any specific groups that I'm involved in, that you know on a recurring basis, there there aren't any specifically around simplicity and minimalism, but um, I mean. Gosh, I get to have this conversation every day with people, and uh, and I love it. Well, that, see, that's the most important thing right there. It doesn't matter what you call it, or even if you call it anything, the fact that you are getting together with folks in your local area, and you're talking about the important stuff, that's the most important thing, regardless of whatever kind of title or whether you can define it in the first place. So, thumbs up, man. Uh, I just want to briefly mention our Simple Rev 2015 events, because it should be pretty cool. And that guy right there in the middle, that is Joshua in action last year. Uh, and we have our Simple Rev uh, annual event coming up on October 2nd and 3rd in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As far as participants, and again, we don't really have attendees with anything that we do with Simple Rev. Everybody participates, whether they share a story, a skill, lead a workshop. Uh, it's it's very active and uh, engaging. So Mark and Angel Chernoff, Arnoush Brock, Donnie McClurkin, Cheryl and John Francois Moreau, Courtney Carver, this guy that I'm pointing at, not me, Joshua. Uh, Joshua, can you just real quick, can you discuss your experience last year at Simple Rev 2014 and just touch on your role for what you're going to be doing this year? Yes, I, uh, I, I would love to. However, before I would, um, uh, this is such a perfect webinar, I mean, such a perfect topic about the connection between simplicity and community because that that is where your heart is um, more than more than anything else. And I, I remember when this conversation first started about doing a simplicity focused conference and um, and then I started talking to you about it and and you keep saying, no, no, it's not a, it's not about the conference, it's about the community that that it can help spur on. And I'm like, wait, it's a conference, not about a conference, but about community. How are you know? Um, but from the very beginning, like this has never been about um, how many people can I get in in one building at one point in time. It's always been about how do we how do we create a movement? How do we create a, a podcast? How do we create webinars that that spurs simple living, um, simple minded, simple living focused people into community with one another? So, um, I, just a, a, a thrill to be involved in in what you're doing and. I guess I got to be the first podcast and webinar. How uh, how exciting! Um, yeah, last year was able to able to just speak a little bit about the the, the simplicity movement and um, kind of an understanding of, of history past and and what the the future might look like as far as how do we how do we keep this momentum growing. Um, was able to speak a a bit about just building a platform. Um, certainly with my experience in blogging and, and writing and, and able to share that. Uh, of course, more than that was just the 
the relationships and the and the conversations that, that took place <clears throat> during meals and and um, in evenings. Uh, this year, I think I, I get to kick off the event again. So yeah, thank you. By the way, and, uh, as as I know right now, I get to kick off the event, and then I just get to hang out uh, with people afterwards and and talk about whatever whatever they desire to talk about. So, uh, <laughs> looking forward to um, getting to do what whatever I can do to, to help out what this uh, movement that you started. Right on. Well, uh, thank you again. Let's, let's turn it over to the folks who have been watching and who are leaving comments. I'm looking at the uh, Google Plus event page right now, and I'm looking at the Twitter stream a little bit. So one thing that I picked up on here is April Lopez. Uh, she was talking about authentic marketplaces. Those real names and photos help. Uh, but one thing that she really wanted to emphasize is being assured of the safety of the community so that people are happy to share their re de real details. Joshua, I know you touched on the safety, you know, creating that safe environment where people can feel comfortable, where they can be vulnerable. I, I, I'm curious from your perspective, and maybe you can elaborate for April's benefit, is there, and this is a general broad sweeping question here, but what, what would you do if you were to join a new community to create that atmosphere of safety? <clears throat> if I were to join an existing community, Joel, <clears throat> I would not um, seek to create a, a safe place. I, I would look to see if it already exists. And if it's already a, a safe place, then, then I would join the community. But if I went to a community and I've, I thought that it was unsafe, whether the, um, you know, it was argumentative or, um, uh, you know, however we we wanted to find unsafe. I I, I think I'd look for another community. Um, uh, maybe depending a little bit on on how big the community is and and how long it's been established. But I, I think that's a real difficult thing to to turn around. And so rather than um, try to try to change a community, I would I would look for one that that already exhibits it. Um, and if I was if I was leading a community trying to trying to create that space, I would. Um, you know, I, I would discourage negative negative comments. Uh, you know, I would um, uh, always encourage with everything that I say. You know, keep keep reminding people that this is a this is a safe place. This is the culture that that we're setting here, um, and uh, and and require some accountability for um, for negative comments. <clears throat> right on. Well, we have another one here. Kate Doster just left one. Uh, she's talking about compassion with non judgment and pairing those two up. I, I struggle with this. Uh, having compassion doesn't come naturally to me. I think I've started to cultivate that over the last few years, and especially not judging. I feel like my default nature is to see something and judge it as good, bad, um, positive, negative, all those different things. Having that for your community is a pretty important thing. How, how would you do those two things, Joshua? Or let, me, let me just turn it a different way and ask that interplay between compassion and non-judgment who do you see does that really well maybe if somebody struggles like me is there a case study or a resource or maybe even a mindset that you have where you can help people out with those two things <clears throat> they are <clears throat> excuse me um those are uh those are very broad words um that tend to be defined very differently by different people. Um, uh, so you know, there's probably a piece where you gotta you gotta pick apart. Okay, what do you mean by compassion, and what do you mean by by non um, non judgmental? But um, but I think as far as a, a key to help spur that on in our lives, uh, number one is just remembering that 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 we that none of us are perfect, right? That that we all have. Um, faults and that, that we all have things that other people probably don't like about us. <laughs> um, this is very interesting when I get, you know, emails from people about, oh, my husband, he, you know, he's so non-simple living and how do I get him to change? And I'm like, you're probably not going to get him to change. It might help for you to remember that you probably have some habits that he is annoyed with, you know, that, that he's patient with um, <laughs> on your end. And so I, I think there's a part that that we all understand that we're in they were in progress, um, and and we always, um, you know, see the see the potential for what someone can become, uh, rather than than what they were or who they were before. Um, looking to see what they can become, and and just finding um, finding compassion through that understanding um, would probably be some 
at least where I would begin that conversation before I figured out, okay, what exactly do you mean by, you know, compassion um, and non-judgment? Yeah, it's, so we use these words pretty frequently. We talk about generosity and compassion and non-judgment and living an intentional life and authenticity. Each of those, depending on who you are, come with uh, either baggage or with a series of assumptions in terms of how they apply, how you practice them, how you see other people doing it. That was not a softball. I know you were supposed to be the one helping me hit a curveball here, but uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the tough ones, aren't I? No, that's good. I don't, I don't mind having these conversations. That's great. <laughs> well, there's, there's one, uh, Penny Wilkins in San Fran. Howdy, Penny. Good to see your name pop up. She's talking about how she's an online educator and has been for a really long time and how, from an online perspective, she gets to know her students much more than her face-to-face -face students. Maybe Joshua, you can touch on a little bit about, and she mentions how that connection comes from being open with information and being authentic. Have you experienced this where it's easier for you to be open and it's easier for you to be authentic in a certain community online as opposed to getting together with a group of folks offline? There is a... Um there's some interesting, yeah, gosh, just some really interesting dynamics as you as you mentioned that. Um, my my relationship with my neighbor um, across the street means that whenever I share with with that person, like I gotta look that person in the face every single day when we go to get our mail, right? So there's so there's a certain part of um, I think being guarded in in that offline relationship just because it's someone that that I'm going to see frequently and um, there's certain things I, I might not feel comfortable uh, revealing um, <clears throat> online can be very different you know I, I can I can be on a page and and I can offer some thoughts or questions or statements knowing that I'm, I may never cross paths with that with that person again and so I think that that has opportunity to bring out both the best and the worst in us right there's a there's a certain courage behind a keyboard to to write and say things about people or to people that we would never say to them to their face, but because we're hidden behind a keyboard, we we feel like we can. Uh, but on the on the flip side, you know, as as uh, Penny mentions, there's also a part where that can that can lead to greater authenticity, and it can lead to greater. Hey, I'm struggling with this right now, and and I know that that I don't have to see that person at the mailbox every day for the for the next year. Yeah. Well, we promised people some good Q&A and I feel we've hit it. Obviously, we want to be respectful of people's time and make sure that uh, we can wrap up on time. So just a, a couple of things. First of all, for the folks who have watched this whole thing, thank you. Uh, we're really grateful that you've shared and you've carved out some of your time for us today. Whether you're listening or watching in the future too, that is absolutely wonderful as well. So the, we covered a lot of ground. The why meaningful and connected communities are so important, how to find your right people online, offline, identifying your community's needs and contributing to them, um, talking a little bit about Simple Rev, what we do to help connect the community and simplicity. Hopefully, Joshua, the folks who uh, are watching, who have engaged us, they've got some kind of new perspective or new tool to simplify their lives through their existing communities or maybe even their future ones. Uh, just a quick heads up, we will be emailing the link to the replay on YouTube in the next 24 hours or so. And you can also watch the replay on simplerev.com. If you go to simplerev.com slash jbwebinar, hopefully, Joshua, obviously this is going to be the end of our conversation, but for the folks who are engaging each other on Twitter, on Google+, and hopefully striking up some kind of relationship, which may lead to community, this doesn't have to be the end of their conversation either. Uh, you can keep the chatter going on the G Plus event page. You can send tweets to at simple underscore rev. Uh, but really, Joshua, I, I just want to thank you a ton for joining me today and also want to mention for the folks who aren't familiar with you, if they want to get more from you, it's on becomingminimalist.com. Anything you want to add? No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for uh, putting this together and all the, all the hard work that you put to make it happen. Well, well 
Thanks again for participating. You, Joshua, everyone else who's watching, leaving comments, sending tweets, interacting with each other, and asking questions in the Q&A. We will be catching you all a lot more soon.